Hey guys, we're live on the moon. It's early, early, early Monday, Monday morning, April the 9th. And I've been itching uh, to get out and see the moon, but we've had cloudy skies and have been socked in. And I have a pretty I, I don't have a totally clear sky, but I got a pretty good, I got a pretty good shot at the moon uh, tonight. Uh, but as you can see, it's a beautiful moon, absolutely stunning moon. I, uh, by the way, my name is Bill Bryson. I'm a uh, amateur astronomer, novice. Uh, don't know too much about any but anything, just about a little bit uh, enough to to get you in trouble and so what this camera does if there's any kind of color up there at all any kind of color when I get in close it'll enunciate it and bring it out it's not a false color it's there's color there it's real and uh, it just amplifies it so you can see it isn't that a beautiful moon guys it's kind of interesting people say there's no color on the moon but yet, here you see very plainly. The, the strange thing is that the astronomers uh, say there's no color on the moon, but you can see the, the Mars, the seas. Uh, I don't know what, you, what you're doing right now, but if you kind of just take a deep breath and kind of look at what I'm showing you, you realize that this is kind of an unbelievable thing you're looking at. This is our moon, guys. And they're and and with the with the color. Isn't this high adventure? I mention uh, I mention that every once in a while, you know, just to get your uh, get your blood going, but I I get really excited when I look at a pretty moon, and this is a real pretty moon. I found that I've uh, most most of the people that don't like my videos are astronomers. They don't like to see the color. They they think that the color is uh, doesn't exist. So old Bill's doing something tricky. <laughs> and old Bill's not doing nothing tricky. I'm just showing you what's up there. I have a crazy observatory. My observatory is a porch and it has a roof. Now how in the hell are you going to see the stars and the planets and the moon with a, a, a roof? <laughs> That's a good question. Okay guys, hope everything's going your way and I wish for you and yours clear skies guys.
For me, making celestial is one of my biggest accomplishments, especially because it's about the true color of the moon. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be here today making this important movie about our closest celestial body in our immediate universe. The photography being presented here is what was going on on the moon in 1994 when the Clementine mission took place. Since then, the Japanese, India, and Chinese space agencies have gone back to the moon. There seems to be a collective effort by NASA and all the foreign space agencies to keep us in the dark about the moon's true essence. When the Chinese probe did a recon over the moon's surface during their press conference, they had this huge tapestry behind them. It was a full-color map of the moon and the north and south poles. However, when they released the same image to the public, it is in black and white. Of the 1.8 million full-color digital photographs taken during the Clementine mission, I have only downloaded a small fraction of what they have. In the archive I now have, I found hundreds of anomalies that are there plain as day. These anomalies are found on the front side and the far side of the moon. This is a crater known as Tchaikovsky, located on the far side of the moon. Just northeast of this crater is a large crater called Lobachevsky. It is 84 kilometers or 52 miles in diameter. The reason I decided to bring you here first is that during the Apollo missions in 1972, there was a special focus put on Lobachevsky by NASA. This is AS16-121-19407. This photo was taken about 75 miles above the crater by Apollo 16 on April 1972. It was a full-color photograph which reveals the surface as a light brown texture. What is unique about this photo is there appears to be a tower with a cross situated within the crevice on the rim of the crater. Looking closer at this crevice, there appears to be a hole on the side to the right of this tower. It almost looks like a tunnel opening made of concrete or metal. What brought this particular crater to my attention is this photo taken by Apollo 17 during the last mission to the moon on December 1972. This particular photo has been spread all over YouTube, Google, and hundreds of websites all over the world. It was taken just eight months after the Apollo 16 photo. This is the original published photo of Lobachevsky taken during the Apollo 17 mission. It is AS17-150-23085. At first glance, there is nothing special here. This is because the Apollo 17 photo was published to the public upside down. So by turning the photo to its correct positioning, we now have a photo that still showed nothing really spectacular. This is because it was published overexposed to eliminate any details. The first thing to do is bring back the original contrast of the photo. The photo was taken in color, so by color correcting it, we now have a full color and better version that reveals what the landscape really looks like. After getting the photo back as close to its original version, we can now see what is really there that was hidden. Zooming into the Lobachevsky crater, we now see what appears to be a huge structure, or as many on the internet have thought, a large spaceship that crashed on the side of this crater. Looking closely, you have what appear to be tentacles or large cables stemming from out the top of this thing. It has an opening at its upper area where you can see a part of the background of the crater through this opening. Now, when I take you to the aerial view of the same crater, taken 22 years after the Apollo 17 mission from 1972, Lobachevsky's object appears to have been completed in its construction. The structure is at least 10 miles wide and perhaps 6 miles high. The fact that Apollo 16 captured the area where this structure would be photographed just eight months later not only proves that there was an excavation going on on the side of the crater, but that eight months later this enormous structure suddenly appears on the Apollo 17 photo. 22 years later, the Clementine mission photographed the same object from 170 miles above the surface and this is what it looks like. There are other specific anomalies going on in this crater. To the left of the structure is this disc-shaped object. 22 years later, it's still there. At the lower area of the crater is this large glowing area that 22 years later is also still there. Another thing to see is there is an opening that has been cut away on the rim of the crater right next to the huge structure. As if to suggest an easy way to get into the floor of the crater without having to rappel down the six mile high ridge to the bottom of the crater. It's as if someone sliced through butter with a hot knife. To the left of the structure there appears to have been a burning glowing thing happening and you can see a bluish white smoke rising out of this area. We don't know what is truly going on. My mind is reeling with questions. 
This evidence shot by NASA brings you to the realization that during April and December 1972, within eight months' time, someone or something built this huge structure 10 miles wide and 6 miles high. Even Donald Trump, with all the money in the world, will never achieve such an architectural marvel. I want to bring to your attention that this evidence filmed by NASA is solid proof that there was or still is someone on the moon capable of constructing such an enormous object spanning 10 miles and reaching 6 miles high over the surface of the moon. You're about to see the moon in full color for the first time in your life and things that are up to 10 times larger than any city in the world. Just to the north of Aristarchus, there appears to be an area where there is mining going on. We don't know who is doing this, but in full color you see there are smoke trails and other activities occurring. You can see what appear to be huge water tanks and large structures of some kind. All these structures are atop this ridge line, and then you see a slant on the surface where there are many strange looking structures. This seems to be a structure that at one glance to me looks like a giant eel with its jaws wide open. To many of you, however, it will look different, but it is a very strange looking structure of some kind. After Bill Bryson viewed my film Moon Rising, 
He was determined to find out whether or not there was something to what I had presented in that movie. His results have become what will be the future of astronomy. No longer will amateur and in some cases professional astronomers have to become part of the perpetual myth about the moon's true essence. Even in these early photographs taken during the Russian Zand missions, before the Apollo missions took place, they reveal that the moon is a full-color celestial body. Bill Bryson has no agendas. He's not trying to make a name for himself nor become a multimillionaire. He is exactly what I am, someone that found something that needs to be shared with the rest of us. His biggest quest in all of this is to get a better telescope so he can get better imagery of our closest neighbor in the universe, the moon. I got real interested in Keller whenever I saw the Jose's film called Moon Rising. I mean, that inspired me big time. Jose's my big big, big hero, and and I've been uh, on a quest to really see the moon in all its glory ever since I saw that film. I did a lot of investigation and, and decided to get the Celestron Nexstar 8SE. Uh, for the money, it's probably the best telescope that anybody could get. It's uh, got quite a bit of features. I immediately went out and bought a whole bunch of cameras for it. Video cameras. One of the first things that I discovered was that these cameras were all standard definition cameras. And immediately I decided, this is not for me. I need to get into high definition. A friend of mine, Henning, uh, on YouTube, discovered a camera and it was a Chinese uh, high-definition camera. I eventually uh, found the source in China and bought a whole bunch of them. In my quest for Keller, <laughs> my experiment was to buy a webcam, a 10 megapixel webcam by Logitech called a C910. I got that camera and I uh, taped it to a, a lens and by damn it worked. <laughs> I mean it worked real good. So me and my friend Mike uh, came up with an interface. Mike had them made up and uh, so we could mount it. The thing about this camera is it works with uh, standard lenses. So standard telescope lenses you can use with this camera. See, most, most uh, astronomy cameras are standard definition and not only that, but they don't work with re regular lenses. They are the lens. Anyhow, to make a long story short, I'm, I'm putting this all in writing as an e-book. I will say one thing, and that is that there is a sweet spot for every telescope and every camera and every lens. And I think that I've, uh, I've definitely uh, determined the sweet spot with the Nexstar 8SE, with a Logitech C910, and some certain very specific lenses. After I downloaded the 850 photographs of the moon in 2009, I started looking at the surface shots and became aware that there are many areas that appear to resemble oceans. While viewing celestial, you will start seeing what appear to be large structures seemingly underwater. It's like looking at a small pond and underneath you see huge rocks that are discernible but you can't see them clearly. This is how I found many of the structures you will see in the film. The Sea of Tranquility, as an example, was named that for a reason. Many of the blue areas are called Mars, which in Latin and Spanish means seas or oceans. I'm not claiming there are vast oceans up there, but you get that visual sense when seeing things that appear underneath some kind of haze in these vast areas. The next section deals with the structures inside craters. I started by looking at the Apollo 17 photo to get ideas from my script. While I was reviewing the Apollo 17 photograph of the structure at the Lobachevsky crater, I noticed something very unusual I had never seen before. Right next to Lobachevsky, there's another crater called Geo. 
Resting at the lower rim of this crater is what looks like a fish-shaped object that has two separate fins at its tail. I immediately had to find out the size of this crater and this thing that's resting there. Geo is a 92 kilometer or 57 mile in diameter crater which is slightly larger than Lobachevsky so this thing laid across the crater three times must be at least 20 miles long and who knows how wide it is but it is quite unique to say the least. I then started looking for as many Geo crater photos I could find. I googled Geo crater and I found something that really made my day. I clicked on the images section and I saw photos that were mistaken for Geo but that were of Lobachevsky taken in 1972. There is this other photo of Lobachevsky in mistaken identity and someone else had found an object sort of floating at the excavation area of the rim. In all my research on the Apollo 16 and 17 photos I have never seen this one. I credit this find to the Real UFOs website out of Australia. In this photo there appears to be an object hovering at the excavation site. There is no tower with the cross in the excavation section, so it makes me wonder, is this how the excavation was done? Is this a type of machine that does this on such a grand scale? Remember, the Lobachevsky structure is about 10 miles wide. So by looking for Geo, I found this, and it has to be what did the excavation. So this really made my day. I started searching for this new Apollo photograph. I googled Geo and found another NASA website. So I clicked on the next link below the photos, and there it is. I found it. However, this NASA website says this is AS16-121-19407. And I thought, this can't be. In the full color photo, you can see the tower and the cross. But in the new photo that we found, there is nothing there except for this newfound anomaly. After reviewing the high-res full color photo and this newfound photograph, I think the tunnel with the mound was misidentified by me. In the full color close-up, you can see this object and its true color, which has this metallic looking area at the front with a beige texture to it. The reason I didn't catch it at first is because of my mind's eye. I have never seen this type of shape before. It looked like a metallic mound to me because a mound is a shape I am used to seeing and that I easily mistook in the color photo. However, in the high res black and white photo, the tower and the cross have disappeared and now it looks way different. When comparing both the full color and this black and white image, both are different. So the jury is still out on the tower and the cross between these two photos. Looking at the aerial view of the same object at Lobachevsky, it does have some type of tower at its opening, so we'll just leave this as it is. What is awe-inspiring is that we may have found what was excavating this area at the time the Apollo 16 photo was taken. Curtis Hedges asked me how could we have missed this one, and the truth is, because it was listed as Geo Crater, had I not caught that fish-looking object resting at the lower area of Geo Crater, this incredible new find would have escaped us. I thank NASA for misidentifying Geo for Lobachevsky because this is how it was found. So now back to the fish-looking object that brought us to Geo Crater. After seeking out more photos of Geo, I did not find any. The only photo that comes up in various sites is a Lobachevsky Crater AS16-121-19407 and it is showing up on other NASA websites. This has become highly suspicious for me because why would this misidentification between Lobachevsky and Geo exist? It just doesn't make sense that there would be such a huge mix-up of these two craters. After searching for a decent Geo photo, I figured out there aren't any to compare with Apollo 17 to see if this fish-like object is or was there before and after the Apollo 17 photo was released. I continued by doing a before and after search of the Apollo 17 mission photos. These are before and after photos of Lobachevsky. I searched the Apollo 17 color film magazines for a considerable amount of time. I stopped editing on the film to find this elusive geo photo and I found this interesting other photo of the Lobachevsky crater allegedly taken on December 1972. The photo is AS17-151-23172. It is in color, but what is interesting is that it shows the structure as it appears in the Clementine color photo 22 years later. It's finished. 
It says this was taken on the second revolution of the mission from an altitude of 126 kilometers or 78 miles, which is a very close shot. We know that the original Apollo 17 photo, AS 17 150 23085, was taken during revolution number 29 of the mission, also from a distance of 78 miles. But they are very different from each other. So either Apollo 17 went forward in time to capture what this structure looks like 22 years later, or there is another mix-up going on here with this important photography. After comparing the Apollo 17 photograph and the Clementine mission photograph, I can state, and you can quote me, both of these photographs are identical except for the glow at the bottom of the crater. In the 1972 photo, there is an object present, where in the Clementine photo, there is this glow, which is also present in the many photos of Lobachowski you will be shown. In researching these photos, I have come to the conclusion that we know nothing about any of the moon missions and whether or not any of the photographs are recent or taken in the past. Because of my trying to make a comparison of the original Apollo 17 photo by finding another photo of Crater Geo to see if this fish-like object was a permanent fixture or something that was there for a moment, I have now come across this new mystery of the photography dealing with Lobachevsky and Geo. I don't know what to think anymore about this. One thing seems to have led to another, and now we have this issue about the structure in the Apollo 17 photograph. How could these two photographs be so identical to each other, supposedly taken 22 years apart? It was already an incredible find knowing the structure was built in eight months, or so it seems. Now we have before us some kind of serious cover-up with this discrepancy between the newly found Apollo 17 photo and the Clementine photo from 22 years later. There seems to be something we just found out that tells us these images are way beyond us knowing when they were really taken. This is just another example of what I feel is one of the greatest stories ever denied the human public. Is this full-color photograph taken of Lobachevsky during the Apollo 11 mission, when we first landed on the moon, the match to the Apollo 17 photograph? There are huge discrepancies going on with the moon photographic archives that have been released to the public. There is no telling what is in the real photography of the moon, and unless we get there to see for ourselves, it seems we will never know the truth. I can only imagine what else they know, and what they have done to keep us dumbed down. You, the public, need to understand that the moon is right there. It is perhaps like another planet. There are so many things and structures there, as you are going to see, that you need to take hold of yourselves and start questioning why we've been misled for all these years and who is behind this. The most important question is why. I have no earthly idea why astronomers don't show it in all its glory. So I spent at least eight hours looking through each and every 70 millimeter Hasselblad photo magazines from Apollo 4 to Apollo 17, searching for that elusive geo photograph that would answer whether or not that fish-like object is a fixture of geo or in fact something else that was only there for the Apollo 17 photo. I looked for the fish-like object in the Clementine color photography and it is nowhere to be seen. Such a large object, if it was a geological formation of some kind, would still be there and because of its size would be seen from high above as the structure that can be seen in the Lobachevsky crater. As with all things you seek out, you eventually hit pay dirt. And so here it is. I finally found the elusive crater Geo. So here it is, AS16-M-1318. And guess what? There is no fish-like object there. I found this in the Apollo 16 metric photography. This brings us to the moon craters that have mysterious looking objects and structures within them. When you see this photography from the Clementine research, you can go to any NASA website and start comparing what you are about to see. In fact, I urge you to start looking at what has been published. You will soon find out, as I have, that many of the photographs that exist and are available for review are way different. The structures you are about to see are not in other photographs. This either means they have been removed or airbrushed out, or they were not yet constructed when the original photos were taken. These are the only two options that come to mind. These incredible crater anomalies are from the Clementine color photography taken in 1994. I would love to get my hands on the full color photography taken by China recently to compare with the Clementine photos. Thank you.
On the near side of the moon, there are interesting craters we found that have structures within them. This requires us to zoom out and see where we're going to go so you can get a perspective. We'll start with Aristarchus because it is the most prominent crater on the near side of the moon. When you look at this area from about 170 miles away, you can see a major portion of the near side of the moon. we move to the west to a crater known as Seleucus. Moving on Seleucus, we find this crater has some very interesting features. First of all, at the top of the rim of the crater can be seen what appear to be tower-like structures. There are other anomalies going on in this area, such as what appear to be large tubing on the right side of the crater. These are curved and seemingly stretching across the rim of the crater in that area. There are other craters that have these types of tubing along the rims. Continuing down the near side of the moon, we come to a very large crater called Marius, which is located at the center area. The striking features inside this crater appear to be that it has a dome over it, and inside are mounds that have a donut hole in their center. These mounds appear all over the surface of the moon, both the near and far side areas. There is this one anomaly close to this crater, and it seems to be something coming out of a cave. It's not shaped like a crater, and there's another one of these in this area. And I am not going to say they are flying, but you can be the judge of that. They are certainly anomalous objects on the moon. Going back to the crater, we move southward. Passing all these amazing colorful and very busy landscapes, we get to a very large crater which will be our focus crater for this region. It's called Jacendi and it is situated atop Mare Humorum. At the bottom of Mare Humorum, I found these two very interesting craters that you can see have massive structures within them. This one crater called Vitello seems to have the dome portion broken or it might have caved in. You can tell the glass-like dome portion is broken. A very interesting thing happened here to cause this damage and we don't have a clue as to the historical record involved in this dome being damaged. The crater is 26 miles in diameter. 
Moving slightly away to the left, we come upon crater Doppelmayr, which is 39 miles in diameter and almost a mile deep. There is no doubt this dome has an interior full of giant buildings and structures within the base of the crater. There appear to be some square buildings and this tall structure has what appears to be the number 2 along its side. Again, you have to look at the sizes of these structures. They are massive. Moving to the right of the crater Vitello, I found this crater called Ramsden. There appears to be a glass or some kind of translucent dome over it. It protrudes upward. The sun is glistening off this area and you can see some green areas within it. You can see some structures in there. When we zoom out a little further, you can plainly see this is in fact a dome-shaped structure. The crater is 15 miles in diameter and a little over a mile deep. Here we have a dome on the moon with some kind of environment going on that was built by somebody. In the last few minutes, I have shown you some very incredible and massive structures. What you're about to see next is what I consider one of the most incredible and mysterious structures I have ever seen on the moon. When I say this, you have to know, it means a lot for this structure to surpass what we have just seen. To give you an idea on how big some of these structures are on the moon compared to the structures here on Earth, let's begin with the tallest statues in the world. This is a comparison in sizes for you to learn. Christ the Redeemer that rests atop a mountain in Rio de Janeiro is 39.6 meters or 130 feet tall. Next is the Motherland Calls, located in Russia, which stands 91 meters or 298 feet tall from the tip of the sword to ground level. Then we have the Statue of Liberty, standing at 93 meters or 300 feet tall. The tallest statue of them all is the Spring Temple Buddha in China, standing at 153 meters or 503 feet tall. All of these architectural marvels were made by humans here on Earth. As an example of the time it took to make these statues, the Statue of Liberty took 21 years to be transformed from an idea to a copper and steel statue that graces New York's harbor. Let's revisit Aristarchus. It is 25 miles in diameter and has a depth of 12,000 feet or two and a quarter miles. When you compare this crater to the surrounding structures, such as the one that resembles an eel with its mouth open, you have to realize that the structure is massive. It's about a third of the size of Aristarchus. Who has the technology to build such a structure, and what does it mean? What is its purpose? The pyramids are wonders we can't explain. But here you have a statue that is massive. Because there is no data anywhere on any NASA website or journals about this statue, we don't have an accurate measurement as to its size, so we had to rely on good old-fashioned comparisons with known objects that we know its measurements. We took the aerial photo of both the statue and Aristarchus from about 170 miles above. We isolated the two areas in identical sized squares, then we put them side by side without manipulating their sizes. Next, we enlarge both squares by enhancing the brightness on the square with the statue. You can now see it a little better. We then isolated the statue and copied and pasted it onto the crater and stacked them on top of each other. It took four statues piled up to fill the diameter of the crater. So by looking at this and knowing the diameter of the crater being 25 miles, this means 25 miles divided by 4 gives us an estimate size of the statue being approximately 6 and a quarter miles tall. Again, without the exact measurements, we just don't know. But it's taller than the tallest statue here on Earth. This six mile tall statue seen side by side with the tallest statue on the Earth dwarfs them in size by miles. 
On the subject of objects and structures that appear to be underwater, here's a perfect example. We have this statue, and near it, you can see what appears to be a monument of some kind, maybe a building or steps leading up to an entrance. We don't know how else to describe these massive structures. Someone built or sculpted the statue, but how? How in the world can anyone sculpt a statue miles high and miles wide? Here on Earth, it's impossible. Yet on the Moon, there it is—something very large that resembles a type of humanoid unlike us. So, if the statue on the Moon is six and a quarter miles tall, which is not an impossibility, you have to imagine whoever built the Moon statue was capable of doing the impossible.
There are many of you that will find everything I present here as an insult, or that I am hoaxing this, or I am just another conspiracy theory nutcase. That is your option. You have the freedom to do so. I just want you to know to remember it is your freedom to be able to know the truth so you can make intelligent decisions in your beliefs. Being denied the truth about the moon means only one thing, and that is your freedom of thought has been taken away from you. You have been conditioned to think inside their box. The rest of us who think outside the box stand united because we know exactly where we stand in the scheme of things. I can't help thinking about my family, knowing my mother and father, their parents, and the millions of people who left this earth never knowing the true essence of our moon. Just knowing they were denied this knowledge gives me a great sadness for them. I imagine, however, they are all smiling at us from wherever they are, knowing the answers to our mysteries. Our moon is not that far away. It is the most beautiful celestial body within our reach. For Bill Bryson, I have the greatest respect and I admire his determination in finding the way for you and I to visit and view the moon in all its glory from right here on Earth. My gratitude extends to the many of you that helped me make this film possible with your generous contributions, whom without this film would have never been made.